the effect of the turning tide can be totally different on a rocking shore. Here on the coast of Vancouver Island in Canada, the sun bakes the exposed rock. It's virtually impossible to dig underground when the sea retreats, so these mussels and barnacles are fully exposed to the heat of the sun, literally cooking in their own shells. And the seaweed simply dry to a crisp. It can be a wait of many hours before the water returns. Throughout each month, the size and strength of the tide changes. The biggest tides of all happen when the gravities of the sun and moon pull in unison. That happens immediately after the new moon. And again, after the full moon. These are called the spring tides. They reveal vast tracts of seabed that would normally be covered. For these raccoons, it's a chance to look for a seafood feast. The mother ventures forth with her kits. With the spring tide, they've come further down the beach than smaller tides would normally allow. Searching with their extraordinarily sensitive paws, they look for suitable prey. With the extreme low tide, they could find something special. And what could be better than a red rock crab? That is, if it weren't for the risk of a painful pinch. With large crabs, there's no substitute for experience. The mother makes an expert's catch. But the kits learn fast. And for those that don't, begging is always worth a try. All too soon, the returning tide will cover the raccoon's table. For all the invertebrates, it's a welcome relief. But in rough weather, they are exposed to the worst of the waves. So now, for this tulip snail, it appears safe to patrol the shallows in search of a meal. But is it? This is a rather bigger kind of snail. At five kilograms in weight, the giant horse conch has little to fear from any shark, and it has a taste for tulip snail. Sensing the approaching danger, the snail flees. But in a world of snail paces, the conch is something of a Ferrari. It calls for desperate measures. Exhausted by the effort of its last ditch attempt, the tulip snail is slowly gunned down. The tide still has to rise for another hour before the big predators can feed. But out on the flats, the scent of dying snail wafts away on the tide. 
It's a scent that these hermit crabs are particularly partial to. It's vital that the crabs have the best possible protection from the heavy teeth of the waiting sharks and rays. For that, they need the shell with a perfect fit. Today, there is new real estate on offer, and competition in this housing market is fierce. becomes even more desperate when the shell of the devoured snail is ready for release. This crab simply can't wait any longer. But it's a decidedly risky acquisition. The risk paid off handsomely. The new shell is both lighter and stronger than the old home, and it's not a moment too soon, because the tide is flowing in strongly, flooding the plains. It's now midsummer, and the sun is shining at full strength. The increasing warmth is the cue for an Atlantic lobster to start on a long journey. She spent the winter 250 metres down, far beyond the reach of the storms. But it was cold down there, and now she needs to find warmer water, so she's marching towards the shallows. They, however, are 150 kilometres away. After a month of walking, she finally arrives at her favoured sandbank. But she's not the first here. Dozens of other lobsters have already dug themselves homes in the sand and they don't intend to surrender them to newcomers. counts for everything in these battles. The new arrival is in urgent need of a pit, and since she weighs a hefty seven kilos, she stands a good chance of getting one. She's won. These battles continue for the next two months, and they're crucial, for the females must have both shelter and warm water if they're to raise their young. For the last seven months, each of these females has been carrying around about 20,000 fertilized eggs. But their task is approaching its end. The warmth of the shallows is speeding the egg's development. Two more months, and the eggs are ready to hatch. At first, they're not very good at swimming. But within a few minutes, the babies are able to set off in a purposeful way. A tiny island lost in the midst of the Pacific. It's the tip of a huge mountain that rises precipitously from the seafloor thousands of meters below. The nearest land is 300 miles away. 
Isolated sea mounts, like this one, create oases where life can flourish in the comparatively empty expanses of the open ocean. But all the creatures that swim beside it would not be here were it not for one key factor, the deep ocean currents. Far below the surface, they collide with the island's flanks and are deflected upwards, bringing with them from the depths a rich soup of nutrients. Such upwellings attract great concentrations of life. Most of the fish here are permanent residents feeding on the plankton, the tiny floating plants and animals that are nourished by the richness brought up from the depths. And they, in turn, attract visitors from the open ocean. Tuna. Plankton feeders are easy targets. All this action attracts even larger predators. Sharks. Hundreds of sharks. These silky sharks are normally ocean-going species, but the sea mounts in the eastern Pacific, like Cocos, Malpelo, and the Galapagos, attract silkies in huge groups up to 500 strong. Silkies seem to specialize in taking injured fish and constantly circle sea mounts on the lookout for the chance to do so. Silkies are not the only visitors. Hammerheads gather in some of the largest shark shoals to be found anywhere in the ocean. Sometimes thousands will circle over a single sea mount. But these sharks are not here for food. They have come for another reason. Some of the locals provide a cleaning surface. Following the last El Nino year, when a rise in water temperatures caused many sharks to suffer from fungal infections, the number of hammerheads visiting the seamounts reached record levels. It returns to the place where it last left its chick in the hope that it might still be close by. But chicks tend to wander, so the adult has to call to it. The chick responds and they slowly home in on one another. The plaintive entreaties of the chick stimulates the adult to regurgitate a mouthful of fish. With the return of one parent, the other is free to go to sea to feed for itself. Aware of the leopard seal's presence, the penguins press together at the ice edge, 
unwilling to be the first to risk diving in. Occasionally, the seal comes out onto the ice and attempts to grab one. Its most successful strategy by far is to lie in wait. It hides behind a corner of ice. The emperors gain confidence and make a dash for it. First wave of penguins escape. Once in open water, they will be safe. But the seal is alerted by the noise, and through the mass of bubbles, it makes its attack. Almost invariably, it makes a kill. <laughs> Encouraged by the absence of the seal, the remaining penguins make a break for the open sea. will fledge, and when the Antarctic autumn is near its end, these adults will walk across the newly formed ice to endure yet another winter on the frozen sea. <laughs>